All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I love these sorts of webinars where we, we kind of go a little bit off topic from the self-directed idea and we just talk a little bit about investing. And so today's topic is how to buy your first rental property. My name is Sean McKay and this is an American IRA presentation. And so at American IRA, we are a record keeper for retirement accounts. And so clients not only use their IRAs and 401ks to invest in stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, but they also invest in alternative assets such as real estate. Now, again, today's gonna to be a little bit different. We're not going to necessarily focus on the mechanics of retirement accounts. We're actually gonna just have a brief conversation around how to think about purchasing your first rental property. And so again, today is kind of a brief overview, but we're always trying to add as much value to the overall investment conversation as we can. Please do, however, keep in mind that this is not meant to be tax, legal, or investment advice. This is purely for entertainment purposes. And uh, this is just simply uh, me as an individual sharing some thoughts on uh, real estate investing, I've made a tremendous amount of mistakes with my investing since 2002. And so hopefully you can go to school on some of the mistakes I've made and uh, have a much smoother journey. Uh, but, you know, happy that I've done it. I continue to stick with it and invest, especially into real estate and especially into rental properties. So this is by no means a theoretical conversation. This is somebody who is out there uh, doing real estate deals. So, the first thing, as obvious as this is going to be to so many of you, I want to just kind of boil down what we're, what we're looking to accomplish in a real estate transaction. I think, unfortunately, so, so many times in the early stages of thinking about making investments, it can all seem incredibly complicated. There's so many moving parts. There's so much to think about and consider. And depending on your personality, maybe worry about and get analysis paralysis. And so one of the things that we talk about a lot um, when I'm just speaking, even with staff members that are looking at making real estate investments, is when you boil it all down, it's as simple as this. We're looking to purchase a property. And in order to purchase the property, we need to have some way to pay for it. So we either have our own cash or the ability to borrow money from some other source. That's it. So it's just a property that we think makes sense. And how are we going to acquire that property? And so from there, we're just going to simply talk about what this looks like and some things to consider before you buy your first rental property. Now, let's be honest. In 2021, if you're listening to this live, almost every metropolitan city is scorching hot. It's a very difficult real estate market. Prices are going through the roof. There's lots and lots and lots of competition. And so what I've found in the, uh, the reality of having gone through entire economic and real estate cycles, I purchased before the 08 crash, I purchased in kind of the height of the 06, 07 uh, period. I purchased the bulk of my properties in the wake and after the 2008 financial crisis. I've kind of seen slower markets, I've seen smoking hot markets. And what I can tell you is that in the really competitive hot markets like we're in today, it is so crucial to do what I call niche down. That means to get really, really specific with what investment you're looking to make. If you're just out there saying, I wanna find a quote unquote good deal, well, there are too many people looking for just a generic good deal. You need to get really focused on a type of property and a type of area that you think would be a good fit for you, at least to start your investing career. It doesn't mean that for the next five or 50 years, you're always going to be buying this type of property, but something that you think is manageable, that you can bite off and you think you can be successful with. So an example of that could be, Instead of saying, yeah, I'm looking for a real estate deal in whatever your metropolitan city is, so say Charlotte, North Carolina, where I live, work, and invest, um, you want to be much more specific. So you might say, I'm looking for a brick side-by-side -side duplex in East Charlotte. It can need substantial repairs, but I want the purchase price to be under 300000 So when you're talking to other investors, when you're talking to wholesalers that can 
find deals for you, they have something to attach you to. If you just simply say, I want to buy properties in Charlotte, well, you and a thousand other people on their buyers list want to buy an investment property in Charlotte. But when you're thought of as the duplex investor in East Charlotte, there is fewer people that are articulating that as kind of their core buying criteria. So it obviously it doesn't have to be duplexes, it doesn't have to be Charlotte, but again, just a little bit of flavor for what that would look like. Now, when we think about location, uh, this can be something that as we're getting granular and we're, we're trying to be organized with our thoughts, this can sometimes be an overwhelming component for people. They want to pick the perfect area. They want to pick the area that they think is going to have the most upside or the, 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 the nicest part of town or whatever the case may be. The first thing I would say, and again, this is just my personal opinion, is try and stay away from the extremes. And by that, what I mean is that, you know, obviously the very most expensive neighborhoods in town don't make good rental properties, whatever that is in your area. It could be $3 million houses, $10 million houses. We're staying away from those. The other end of the spectrum, I would argue, can be very challenging as well. The, the absolute roughest parts of your metropolitan area, um, it's difficult. It's difficult, if nothing else, just simply to find good quality people that want to live in a very, very um, crime-ridden part of town. So if it's a scary part of town, there's lots of crime, violence, whatever the case may be, it's going to be very difficult to attract quality tenants. And at the end of the day, the success of our portfolio is going to be driven by having quality tenants stay for a long time. And so I would stay away from the extremes. Everything else in between, that's going to be personal preference. I would argue at least to start, the closer you can be to the part of town that you live in, it's probably going to be the area that you know the best. It's gonna be the easiest area for you to drive around and to find different pockets that you think uh, there could be some value in a particular deal. But at the end of the day, it's, it's not necessarily the most technical exercise. It's just simply kind of identifying an area that makes sense for your portfolio. And again, it could be just location to you. It could be price point driven. I can afford to buy this type of house in this type of area, um, whatever you think makes sense. But you know, as I said here, it's the intersection of what you can afford to buy and what you feel comfortable owning. And so... You know, I think as you go on in your investing career, you're very possibly going to want to be uh, owning the highest quality properties that you can uh, afford to buy and afford to maintain. And those tend to historically have kind of the greatest appreciation. And so that really is just a way of thinking about it, which brings us to the team members that I think we should strongly consider. So for me at the beginning of the journey, when I was out there trying to do real estate deals, I got some great advice that the first thing I want to do is line up where the money is going to come from. And so for so many of us, we don't have this enormous bank account with millions of dollars, we're going to need to borrow money. And so that's typically going to start with some sort of a mortgage broker. If you have some sort of solid W-2 type job, uh, that can be your secret weapon because it can make it much easier for you to get financing for properties than those individuals that are kind of in the gig economy or they're 1099 or maybe they're an entrepreneur just starting off. And so mortgage brokers are a great place to start. You can also work a lot with private lenders. If you're able to create a relationship with somebody who maybe they have a retirement account and they're not thrilled with the stock market, they can be a great source of funding for your real estate deals as well. So that'd be the first place I'd start. I'd wanna line up the amount of capital, see what I have available to me, get pre-approved with a mortgage broker so that I know what I can go out there shopping for. If you get pre-approved for a $200,000 property, probably doesn't make sense to go looking at the $300,000 properties, right? So that's, that's one piece. The realtor, certainly for your on-market real estate deals, wholesalers are going to be a great resource for you uh, for deals that are not listed with realtors, not on the MLS. I think those can be really valuable relationships. So, you know, as I say here, call them, take them to lunch, create a real relationship, stay in front of them. They can feed you deals. And also I would say 
incorporating your property manager into the front end of your searching for properties is going to be valuable. They might know about a client that is looking to sell a property so they can make you aware of a deal before it hits the MLS. Of course, I'm sure they're going to want to draw a commission if that's allowable and they're a realtor in your area, uh, but that can be a great way to source deals. They can also give you some ideas about areas that you might want to stay away from or areas that they're not willing to manage properties. They're going to be able to give you a lot of insights as to what the rental values are so that you can kind of plug in these numbers and make sure it's a property that you can afford. So these are the team members that I'd really focus with on the front end, building those relationships. And again, with the mortgage broker, getting pre-approved, knowing what you actually have, <clears throat> excuse me, the ammunition to do. So there is a lot of uh, content out there about how you can make a real estate investment. You can buy a rental property with none of your own money that you don't actually need to have cash to be a real estate investor. That is technically true. And I can tell you, I've bought a number of properties without using any of my own personal cash. But what I will tell you is if you're doing that out of necessity because you do not have any cash, I firmly believe that buying rental properties when you do not have any cash is a very dangerous thing to do because I can't tell you how many times I have bought a property Friends in town have bought properties, and then the day after closing, the air conditioning unit goes out, or you find that there's a leak in the roof after a big rainstorm, or there's some sort of significant capital expenditure, and if you don't have the cash to be able to take care of those properties before the property starts producing revenue for you, you can be in a very bad spot very, very quickly. So ultimately, my feeling is you shouldn't buy rental properties until you've actually built up capital reserves. This isn't going to be a get rich quick scheme. You're going to need to kind of build a real small business around your rental properties. So in an example, let's say you're buying a $200,000 rental property. If you needed to put down 20% with your mortgage broker, you're looking at $40,000 right there. In terms of closing costs, depending upon your area, it might be another three thousand repairs after closing. Maybe that's twenty five thousand. Hopefully, it's a property that's worth three hundred thousand after you put the money into it. But usually, the property needs at least something after closing. And then I argue that per property, per rental unit, you'd ideally like to have ten thousand dollars per, as they call it, door. Some people say far less. I can just, again, tell you as someone who's survived the different parts of the market cycle, cash is going to be very, very valuable to save you. Because if you think about it this way, we're still in this pandemic. In 2020, there is this huge moratorium on rents. We're just starting to work out of this moratorium where tenants don't have to pay rent. And so if you're having to make mortgage payments and your tenants are not able to or not willing to pay rent, you have all this money that you must be responsible for going out for the mortgage payment, for repairs to properties, things like that. And then ultimately, you're going to need to service that some way. So again, I'm a firm believer in keeping a pretty substantial cash cushion. So in this example, as you can see on this $200,000 property that admittedly needs a good bit of work after you buy it, in this case, you'd need about $78,000 of cash to be able to deal with all of these different elements. So this isn't to scare you off, it's just to give you a little bit of perspective. Again, uh, we've seen clients, we've seen investors in town that can put this deal together and they get such a good deal with the purchase price that a lender is willing to give them all the money for the purchase, all the money for the repairs, but those are kind of special circumstances. So just a little bit of food for thought there. So hopefully that kind of gets you, your, your juices flowing in terms of how to think about real estate, some team members that you need involved in looking at your first rental property. And uh, that's really just what we're trying to do here from a content perspective is just trying to add a little bit of value. So our next webinar is going to be November 8th at noon Eastern Standard Time. So that's advanced real estate strategies with your self-directed account. So that's kind of going to be the other end of the spectrum. We'll talk about really unique terms and strategies that most real estate investors are not familiar with. And those can be done with or without self-directed retirement accounts as the owner of the property. 
So even if you can't attend that live, feel free to give us, uh, excuse me, feel free to register for that event and we'll send you the recording even if you can't join us live for that. Also, if you're looking for additional content, please check us out at American IRA LLC on our YouTube channel. So again, the YouTube channel, American IRA LLC, and we have a significant amount of videos there for you to, to review in your own time. So that's it for us today. Again, I really appreciate everyone joining us. Uh, so I'm Sean McKay with American IRA. My email is Sean, S-E-A-N, at AmericanIRA.com. And our office number is 828-257-4949. If you're interested in having a conversation about retirement accounts and making investments into real estate, we'd love to be a resource for you. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a great day.